Hey everyone, this is Pete, and welcome back to Atari A to Z, a series of short playthroughs of Atari 8-bit games, some which I grew up with, and some which are new to me. Today's game is Firebug, which was a 1984 release for Atari 8-bit, developed by Kyle Peacock and Tom Hudson. Now, Peacock and Hudson were two frequent collaborators in Analog Magazine, they put out a lot of games together, and like most of their games for Analog Magazine, this was distributed as a type-in listing. The original game was developed using the OSS Max 65 assembler, but the actual basic type in listing in Analog Magazine was uh, something that you would type in with a bunch of meaningless data statements, or seemingly meaningless data statements anyway, and then the basic program would convert that into an executable file for cassette or floppy disk. And so basically you ended up with something that was comparable to a commercial game in terms of how you ran it and that sort of thing. And Analog Magazine became renowned for its high quality machine code games, which in some cases found their way across the pond into other magazines such as Page Six. In other cases were distributed as part of public domain connections, but a lot of people just imported Analog Magazine from the States as well in this country as well, and just so they could type in the listings and read the articles and all that sort of thing as well. So Firebug is a game I vaguely remember playing back in the day, but not a great deal about. So I've been quite interested to return to this because my vague memories are that it was quite good. <laughs> so I guess we'll see. So let's go play Firebug. Okay, here we are with Firebug by Kyle Peacock and Tom Hudson. And the reason their names are cycling back and forth like this is because they couldn't decide whose name to put first. So they put both of them first. <laughs> anyway, uh, the lore behind this game is that deep beneath the earth, there is a race of firebugs. And uh, every so often, the entire race dies out aside from one queen uh, who lays a bunch of eggs which will eventually hatch into a new civilization of firebugs but in the meantime the queen firebug has to defend uh, the firebug eggs from the predators and also from the mess that humanity has inevitably made of the world uh, by dropping sort of bombs and stuff underneath so let's play and see how things go so I am the firebug up here. You wander around. These little pulsating circle things, these are the firebug eggs. These are some bombs which you can set off by walking past them. And they will then explode in the region around it. And your job is to go and blast all of these predators. Now if you leave the predators for too long they will breed so there's two different types of predators there's two different types of predators um there's these ones that sort of look a bit like rap sweets whoops and then there's the ones that look a bit like uh sort of shuriken and the one begets the other basically begets makes the other whatever <laughs> whoops oh dear i'm not very good at this i think that sound we can hear there might be them breeding and there's one coming for the eggs here so i'm gonna blast him out of the way So these ones are all breeding because they're so close together. So there we are. I blast a big hole in the centre of their arrangement and that makes things a little more manageable. You'll notice at the bottom of the screen you've got um, a meter that goes down when you fire shots. That will replenish over time. It will replenish slower when you're standing still or moving through uh, empty spaces but it will actually replenish faster while you're digging the trade-off to that of course is the fact that you move more slowly while you're digging whoops oh no yeah, tricky little game this Right, let's 
going on down here? Oh no! The eggs are escaping! Yeah, if you let the eggs out of the, the initial bit that they're in, um, then they will start moving around just to be extra inconvenient. So yeah, you really need to keep an eye on the whole level and make sure you're aware of what's going on at all times. sure how you finish the level. Presumably it's you defeat all the predators. But there's no indication of how many are left or where they are. So I guess it's just a case of exploring until you find them all. Can't be that many left now, surely. We even saved some of the eggs. You. Well, this, this collection is untouched. Feels good. down there. So yeah, from what I read in the episode episode uh, issue of Analog that this came from is uh, this game was sort of primarily designed as a demonstration of um, doing what was referred to as fine scrolling on the Atari 8 at that time, which is sort of scrolling by pixel, which makes it look nicely smooth. And that's one of those things that uh, a lot of programmers would like to sort of demonstrate in the things that they put in magazines and even for commercial software and stuff because it's it's sort of a real demonstration of mastery of the Atari hardware. Oh, I finished the level. How about that? All right. So yes, it is uh, destroy all the predators to move on to the next level. No, you're eating my things already. Or is that a breeding sound? Not 100% sure on what all the sound cues are just yet. No, that's an eating sound. How oh, upsetting. Oh, very upsetting. All right, we got this this time. Thinking back on playing this back in the day, I remember enjoying it for um, it being a digging game that wasn't sort of about puzzle solving. Because I, I liked Boulder Dash, but I also found Boulder Dash quite frustrating because there were elements of Boulder Dash that involved timing and puzzle solving and stuff that as a kid I found very, very difficult and almost, almost impossible in some cases. Um, whereas this... This includes the thing that I like about that kind of game, which is sort of digging through the dirt and basically sort of creating the level as you go, if you like, by digging out panel, pa pathways and tunnels. Um, yeah, so that was exactly the sort of thing I, I like from this kind of game, but uh, with a bit of a twist, a sort of arcade style shoot about twist. Now, I believe if you press a number key, you can start from that level. Yeah, if you look down at the bottom, you can start at any level up to nine, I think. Uh, let's have another go at level two. 
since that's where we got to before. And let's see if we can't do a little bit better for our children. eating them already. My poor eggs! Whoops! So yes, you can blow yourself up in the bombs, if you were wondering. <laughs> Come here. Not sure offhand what happens if all of the eggs get de uh, get uh, eaten. I don't know if that ends the game completely or if it um, just makes you lose a life. We may well find out. But yeah, we've talked a little bit about this before. This is a good example of the sort of thing you could expect from a type-in game from Analog Magazine. Analog really prided itself on uh, putting out high-quality machine code games. It did do some basic stuff as well, but the, I'd say probably the majority of its type-in games in particular uh, were machine code ones like this. And as I say, a lot of these um, games in particular became so popular with the overseas audience, overseas from America, that is, um, that these games would often find themselves I I finding their way into public domain libraries, and sometimes they'd be republished in other magazines. We've done it! Level 3! And in fact, probably Analog's biggest contribution to um, sort of computing and magazine culture in this country for the Atari 8-bit was the fact that um, what I mentioned in the intro is where the, the basic program would create an executable machine code file for cassette or disc uh, because that routine was used in so, so many type-in listings that was easy. <laughs> that routine was used in so, so, so many type-in listings from uh, magazines like Atari User and Page Six. Um, and it wasn't until relatively late in the lifespan of Page Six that that got replaced uh, by a much more high-speed version of something that did the same thing. So it was, it was the same kind of routine. It, it would read through and check all the data statements and then it would turn all those data statements into an executable file. Um, the original analog one worked very well and very reliably, and the big advantage of it was that it, it would check um, that you had typed all the right things in to make the program work. Um, but the trouble with it was it was a bit slow. So like once you type the system in, you'd need to run it, and then you'd need to go off and have your dinner or something. <laughs> because it would, it would take ages to go through and check each line of data statements one by one. It would check the hexadecimal values that you typed in against a checksum value, a numerical checksum value that was in um, decimals. And then it would basically go through all of them again um, and write them to disk or cassette. And as you can probably imagine, that took quite a while. Particularly in the case of larger games. 
and a lot of analog stuff tended to air on the larger side of things. That's because a lot of the a lot of the programmers who contributed regularly were quite ambitious, and they wanted to prove that you could you could put out full scale commercial quality games as a type in listing. And they did it as a service to the Atari community. They did it because they enjoyed creating these games. They did it because they enjoyed demonstrating how they put these uh, these games and routines together. Carl Peacock and Tom Hudson um, were quite well known in this regard because they would tend to provide the assembly language source code listings for um, the games they made as well. That was fairly common practice, but didn't always happen. But yeah, Carl Peacock and Tom Hudson were, were very keen for other people to use the routines that they had developed. And so they provided the source code there so that people could study that source code, see how they'd achieved certain things. And then hopefully make their own work from that. And that was the super important part of um, computer culture back in the 80s. Because al although there were books and magazines and all sorts of things available to um, help teach you these things, the best way to learn things was by studying other people's code. And in the case of BASIC, that was very practical to do because every computer had basic built into it or at least in the early days had easy access to basic you'd have a cartridge with basic on it in the early days but once the atari computers got onto their later models basic was built in so that as soon as you turned the computer on you were into basic you could start programming you could start typing things in And you can easily use other people's work as a basis for your own. And that was an absolutely essential part of how people learned to use their computers in those days. Because although these computers were fairly widespread and well documented, there were plenty of instances of clever programmers discovering that you could do things with these computers that maybe the original design of the hardware never intended. And that's still going on to this day. So if you if you look at sort of the modern releases from like the um, the European Atari scene in particular a lot of very talented programmers coming out of places like Poland and Germany uh, and probably some other places as well but they seem to be the real hot spots these days yeah a lot of those people are still discovering new ways to get the absolute best out of this hardware and it continues to amaze and inspire me because although I personally never got that far in my own sort of programming efforts. Whoops. I still learned some stuff from um, typing listings in magazines. I still learned some stuff from tutorials that people were good enough to publish in magazines. And just from experimenting. And that for me is something I think that we've kind of lost to a certain degree these days. Yes, it is easy enough to download a copy of Unity or Unreal Engine or whatever and, and, and tinker around with that. But I feel in those cases there's a sort of baseline expectation that you understand certain things already. Whereas the nice thing with BASIC was that, as the name suggests... As the name suggests, you could go right from the absolute basics... And get something happening. 
it was really exciting for new computer users to be able to do something as simple as make some text appear on the screen or do some mathematical calculations or anything like that And while yes, there is that satisfaction there with the stuff like the Unity and Unreal and all that sort of thing. The sort of baseline knowledge required to make it happen, I think, is, is much, much greater. And I, I've not delved into that side of things myself, but from my understanding, before you... Before you start looking at something like Unity or Unreal, you already need an understanding of a language that you can use with that. Which I assume these days is probably something like C-sharp. <coughs> oh, excuse me. I, I, I don't even know, because it's... There's so many steps to get started these days. It's not a case of 10 you can be drawn and type 10 print hello 20 go to 10 anymore. You need to fire up a development environment. You need to program your thing. You need to compile it. You need to run it. There's all sorts of dependencies to worry about depending on what operating system you're using. Yeah, I, I definitely miss these days. But at the same time, at the same time, I reckon today's programmers are probably quite glad that they don't need to write things in assembler anymore. <laughs> Because I, I, I've tried, I've tried sort of reading things about programming and assembly, and it just kind of further adds to my opinion that people who know how to program in assembler are literally wizards. <laughs> because the thing, the thing with assembler is you're directly addressing certain things in the machine itself. You're talking directly to the machine's hardware, its memory, its um, its chips and whatever. And you're storing various values and things. And what I don't understand is how... how storing certain numbers in certain places causes, uh, like, this to happen. <laughs> Like, if you load all the right numbers into the accumulator, whatever that is. And then do something with them. Presumably we poke those values into memory or something like that. Yeah, eventually you end up, you end up with firebug. <laughs> it's even more magic to me when... Um, you look at those basic listings that you would have typed in to get access to these games from the magazines because that those are literally a string of hexadecimal numbers which is the the, the raw machine code that the the raw machine code that the computer is is interpreting to uh, to make all these things happen and yeah it just seems like magic to me it still seems like magic to me to this day but uh, anyway Anyway, I've rambled on enough about that sort of thing. That was Firebug from Kyle Peacock and Tom Hudson, or Tom Hudson and Kyle Peacock, published in Analog Magazine. Um, the game I've actually been meaning to revisit for quite some time, so I'm glad I finally remembered to do that. Uh, but anyway, yeah, if you want to give that a go for yourself, it is freely available today, what with it being originally published in the magazine and all that. And if you want to type it in yourself, um, you can track down that copy of analog magazine on atari mania as well and if you really want to get the authentic experience type the whole thing in save it to a disc or cassette and uh, there you go 
Anyway, let's leave that there for today. As always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again next time.